Good morning, all. Morning. A warm welcome to our worship this morning. A warm welcome, especially if you're visiting with us today. If you don't have to hurry away, there will be tea and coffee across in the gathering place uh, at the close of the service. And when you go over there, uh, we had a flower festival uh, in the hall uh, just over the last few days. I've just been told uh, that there are leftover croissants that you can help yourself to, uh, if you so wish. I, uh, and I now pat myself on my, my back because I remember between the vestry door there and coming back out again to tell you that. So there you go. You know me well enough now to laugh at that. Uh, this morning we welcome Blair Edwards to the organ bench um, as he come among, comes amongst us as our permanent organist along with Stuart on the last Sunday of the month. Um, so in a sense it's welcome back Blair after uh, some, some time. Um, we're delighted to have you among us and to welcome you uh, as part of our, our church family today. Thank you for being here Blair. Um, other notices, this afternoon, Leavenmouth Churches together have a service, an outdoor service in Leaven Festival Gardens, that's just by the Leaven Beach home, um, on the theme of creation. Uh, if you're feeling energetic and you wish to join a litter pick prior to the service, please gather at the car park ramp on the prom at 2 p.m., but the service is at 3 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. And then, uh, on Thursday, we have the joint church session, which of course is not a constituted meeting because you can't have a, a joint church session that's a constituted meeting. It's just a gathering to discuss things and any, any decisions we make will have to be then um, accepted by the respective church sessions subsequently. But nonetheless, we gather uh, as the two church sessions in St. Kenneth's and the church at Kennaway at 7 p.m. on Thursday. We're grateful to some folks there who have put on refreshments or who will have put on refreshments. Uh, for us to enjoy uh, while we're there. And then um, for Leaven here specifically, the ordinary Kirk session date uh, that was the 26th, I think, of September um, has been moved to the 2nd of October. The 2nd of October is definitely the new date, the 2nd of October at 7 p.m. Um, to take account of leave that I am uh, putting in the diary um, over the next few weeks, or over the next few months I've got weeks of leave to take um, still left over. Um, so a, um, that's the reason for that. But uh, that's the 2nd of October for leaving session uh, across in the Lesser Hall. And in the spirit, I should just say as well, in the spirit of um, wanting to reach out to me and be of help to me, um, just given what uh, has been going on uh, over the last number of months, um, I guess in Iona's absence, um, Alec Shuttleworth, the Presbytery Clerk, who was minister in Kincardine, and so I've known him for many years, um, has offered uh, a free Sunday, as it were, that doesn't count towards my allocation. And so uh, next Sunday for the service here, Alec will conduct worship uh, for us, and so we're grateful to that. Um, St. Kenneth's visitors, don't worry, I am doing the guild dedication earlier at 10 o'clock, um, but then having a bit of a break uh, thereafter. Um, so I will be there for the guild dedication before uh, Etta and Margaret panic over there. Um, yeah. For each one of us, every day is filled with thousands of choices. What to wear, what to eat, whom to talk to, where to go, and so on. Every day we must make decisions on these and many other issues. Yet in the midst of all these choices, which may or may not have long-lasting consequences, we are given a choice to make which will shape us for this life and the life to come. As we continue our series into the heart of Romans today, we will discover that Paul gives us a choice to make between what he calls the life of the flesh and the life of the spirit. In our worship today, we will examine the implications of that choice together. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn is a hymn in which we seek the spirit, the hymn at 489, Come Down, O Love Divine, the hymn 489.
Let us pray. As we approach you in prayer, Almighty God, we bring our minds before you, minds which seem at times to be set on the things of earth, and minds which at other times seem to be set on the things of the Spirit. Help us as we worship, Almighty God, to focus upon you and all that you're doing, to turn our lives over to you in every part, to find that our hearts are filled up with praise for you. When our minds are set on you, Lord, we find ourselves on the path of life and peace. We thank you that on that path we find fellowship with you in the secret places of our hearts. We find fellowship with one another in this place. We find fellowship with your people throughout this world and indeed in the world to come. For these many blessings we worship you. As we approach you in prayer, almighty God, bringing our minds before you, we acknowledge that there are times when we stray from the path you would have us take. We focus too much on that which can never bring lasting peace. We focus too much on that which indulges our own interests. We focus too little on that which leads us to you. In confession, we turn to the one who put aside all vain self-interest as he died and rose again for us, even Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name, we confess our sin. Sisters and brothers, if you have sincerely confessed your sin, you belong to Christ and may be at peace with him. How we praise you, Almighty God, that as those who have been forgiven, we are in the Spirit. It is in the power of the Spirit and in the name of the Son that we bring these prayers now, even as we gather up our prayers in the words of the family prayer of the Church, in every age and place which Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we set our minds on the things of the Spirit, we pray as we sing for more of the Spirit in our lives. The hymn, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Let's remain seated as we sing this reflective hymn, which is at two numbers in the book, but it's really the same hymn flowing, each verse flowing in, into the other. The hymn 619 will flow straight into the hymn 620, the same tune. 619. Our scriptures are brought to us now by Neil. Thank you. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 11. 
For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. Amen. In our reading, Paul focuses on our minds. And so as we prepare to think further about the passage, we sing a hymn which is a prayer that the mind which was in Jesus might also be in us. The tune we're using is the one from Mission Praise, which I hope will actually be more familiar to you than the one in the hymn book. The hymn is, May the mind of Christ, my Saviour, live in me from day to day. The hymn 536, 536. Let's pray. Lord, in these precious moments with your word before us, help us to set our minds on the promptings of the Spirit. Amen. East Fife versus Wraith Rovers. Celtic versus Rangers. Looking at nobody in particular, Tom. <laughs> Scotland versus England. Also looking at nobody in particular, but anyway. All of these are examples of sporting rivalries. The first two are exclusively footballing rivalries, and the latter may appear in other sports as well. In the world of sport, rivalries are common. 
At their best, they allow healthy banter between rival sets of supporters. At their worst, they can provoke violence and abuse, which, of course, even as a sports fan, I would never condone. But the idea of rivalries is one with which we're all familiar. However, you may not have considered that actually the idea of rivalries is there in the spiritual life as well. There are rivalries which are a part of our spiritual lives. Yet as we continue our series into the heart of Romans today, looking at chapter 8 of that letter, we will see that Paul tackles head-on a great rivalry which plays out in the spiritual life, the rivalry between the life of the spirit and the life of the flesh. We mentioned last week the great contrast between the life Paul wanted to live and the life he actually lived. And I quoted some verses from Romans chapter 7 to illustrate the contrast. Paul also sets up his argument about the rivalry between the life of the spirit and the life of the flesh in Romans 7. Listen to these verses. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Here, Paul is caught up between wanting to do good, yet finding because of sin, that which we labelled last week as our imperfections, he ends up doing wrong. There is a rivalry in his heart between the life of the spirit and the life of the flesh. And it's the same with each one of us. It may well be that we don't want to admit it, but within each one of our hearts there is a great rivalry between the life of the spirit and the life of the flesh. What do we learn about this rivalry and how it affects our lives from these verses in Romans 8? Firstly, we see that this is a rivalry between two different mindsets. In verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. In 2006, the psychologist Carol S. Dweck made a splash with her book, Mindset. Dweck was interested in how people cope with failure. She ran a series of observations of children who were given increasingly difficult puzzles to do. She watched as some of the kids threw up their, threw up their hands in frustration and said, I just can't do it. But other kids would sit down in front of a hard puzzle, rub their hands together and say, I just love a challenge. Dr. Dweck said that the difference was mindset. Mindset, said Dr. Dweck, profoundly affects the way you live your life. I think Paul would have agreed with Dr. Dweck that mindset profoundly affects the way we live our lives. I think he would have agreed because the phrase set their minds that he uses is really one word in the Greek which means to be absorbed with something, to focus sharply on something. It is not just an occasional glance at the things of the flesh, but a mindset in which a person's whole life revolves around the things of the world. That sense of being absorbed with something is interesting. Some of us could readily name things in our lives with which we might say we can become absorbed. For some, football is a good example. For myself, as you know well enough by now, even here, I can become very absorbed in my music. It is certainly true that both sport and music are given more than their fair share, more than an occasional glance as I live my daily life. The question is, when all is said and done, do I live according to the flesh or according to the spirit? 
Is my mind, is your mind set on the things of the flesh or on the things of the spirit? I suggest that to find enjoyment in things such as sport and music is not wrong, but fundamentally, what is of greater importance to us? Making sure that we are there to cheer on our team or being cheered on by Jesus and the saints who have gone before us, that we might set our minds on the things of the Spirit. There is a great rivalry between two mindsets. Secondly, there's a great rivalry between two different destinies. In verse 6, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. When we go on a journey, perhaps a car journey, there will nearly always be a point on that journey when we reach a junction or a crossroads. And at that junction or crossroads, if we're the person driving anyway, we have a choice to make. We can either go left or we can go right. Choosing one direction over the other will significantly alter our final destination. At this point in his argument, Paul brings us to a junction or a crossroads. And we're faced with a choice, and the choice we make will impact for all eternity our final destination. Will we be on the path to death, or on the path to life and peace? It is important for us to think about what those two paths, or where those two paths take us, and what they refer to. The path to death is not merely referring to the death of our physical bodies but rather to the stark possibility of eternal separation from God. When Jesus wrote to the seven churches in Revelation, letters which you can find in chapters 2 and 3 of the last book of the Bible, he wrote the following to the church in Smyrna, which is in modern-day Turkey. And to the church of the, the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty. Even though you are rich, I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have affliction. Be faithful unto death, and you will have I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let everyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. The second death Jesus refers to here is that ultimate separation between a person and God, when with a hard heart that person has continually resisted the love of God. Fundamentally, Jesus wants no one to be harmed by that second death. Indeed, in the verses I've just read, he says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus has a crown of life ready to place on each one of our heads, as it were. Many of you will have watched the coronation of His Majesty King Charles. It was a great spectacle, with much ceremony and grandeur. Friends, Jesus has planned the most amazing coronation ceremony for each and every one of us. All we need to do is choose to set our minds on the Spirit, which leads to life and peace. There is a great rivalry between two different destinies. Upon which path will we travel? Thirdly and finally, there is a great rivalry between two different dispositions, the believer and the unbeliever. In verses 7 to 9, for this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Essentially, what divides the unbeliever from the believer is that issue of belonging. 
Do I belong to the world or the flesh, as Paul has it here, or do I belong to the Spirit? It is innate in all human beings that we feel the need to belong. Societies form because people come together in order that they might work out this business of life alongside others. And unrest occurs, as sadly in the recent riots in the UK, when there is a threat to the harmony of a society. People feel the need to belong. Of course, we can extend this out from society in general to particular groups. Why do people affiliate themselves with various political parties? Because they want to feel that they belong to a group of people who share their views about the world, about society and how it should be ordered. And for ourselves as a church especially, why do people feel the need to belong? Because they want to be part of something that takes them beyond themselves and enables them to express in worship and service what they believe about the world and their place in it. As a church community, our task is to make this place and what we do here accessible enough that people coming through the door for the first time would feel as though they belong to us. But if we are to do that well, we must of course decide for ourselves to whom we belong, to the world or to God. And so do you, do I, belong to the flesh or to the spirit? There is a great rivalry between two, these two dispositions. Rivalries can be fun, as in the case of sport. But today, Paul is asking us to acknowledge a far more important rivalry, a rivalry at work in the human heart between the flesh and the spirit. God invites us to set our minds on him, to choose the path of life and peace, and to choose to whom we belong, the flesh or the spirit. Friends, you will never make more important choices. By all means, make choices when it comes to sport. But when it comes to our hearts, might we choose Jesus, who has a crown of life prepared for all who would receive it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Paul spoke of the Spirit of God dwelling in those who chose, or who choose the life of the Spirit. Our hymn in response to God's word makes this our prayer. Spirit of God, come dwell within me. We sing the hymn at 722 and remain standing thereafter for the dedication of the offering. The hymn 722.
continue to worship God in the dedication of our offering as we sing O Mataya. And our prayers are brought to us now by Rosa. Thank you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning to pray for others and ourselves, help us never to forget the message of your love. You restore those who have fallen. You are the help of the helpless, and you seek out those who are lost. May we forever put our trust in you. Heavenly Father, enable us to continue to adapt to this ever-changing world, to climate change, to the many migrant people desperate for sanctuary and inclusion. Help us to have the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, but have the courage to change the things we can. Enable us to adapt to a church structure that is changing shape, and whose walls are crumbling, but whose head and foundation stone remain unchanged. In many instances, the old has passed away and the new has taken its place. Inspire and encourage those who are your change makers. Give hope and courage to those who fear change. Recreate us in your love and make us fit for your purpose in the world. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine in their ongoing struggle against Russia, particularly when it appeared in Friday's news that what Ukraine and its allies have long feared is actually now happening, and Iran is supplying Russia with ballistic missiles. Please, dear Father, we pray that they never take the decision to fire nuclear missiles. We pray also today for those in the outgoing unrest in the Middle East. Give support, strength and hope to the people of Gaza and hold in your loving care all relatives and friends of those very many people who have been killed. We think especially of all the thousands of children who have lost their lives. Lord, bless them. Ever caring and compassionate God, who caused the light of the gospel to shine throughout the world through the preaching of your servant, St. Andrew, grant that we may follow him in bearing witness to your truth. All this we ask in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosa. For Paul to set the mind and the spirit is life and peace. In our closing hymn, we rejoice as we sing that the name of Jesus is life and health and peace to us. The hymn is at 352. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. 352.
And so may that life and health and peace that comes from the life of the Spirit be yours this day and forever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit now descend upon you and remain with you and with all those whom you love, those here now, those further afield, and those now at rest and gathered with their Maker on this day and forevermore. Amen.